The important thing to remember in 1914 and 1915 was that young men saw it as a point of honour to voluntarily enlist as opposed to being ordered to join or, you know, being called up as we say today. As history records, oh, the war will be over by Christmas and it was all a bit of a, a hoot. Let's get over there, we're going, to, we're going to bash the Bosch. They didn't know what they were going into. They had no concept of what we now know as a world war. He mentioned to me the horror of being in the trenches on a daily basis. Everywhere was mud, everywhere was water, ankle deep. That there was the stench of the mud, there was the stench of cordite, there was the stench of death. It was an attack the Germans had prepared for. Um, it was quite massive in terms of the munitions and the divisions that were involved. Partly made possible by bringing divisions from the Eastern Front because Russia had they'd reached a peace with Russia, with more, more or less a Russian surrender. And they moved these divisions to the Western Front. So for the first time in a long time, the Germans had a major force and they launched this offensive. And it pushed the British Army right back in terms of, uh, they went back several miles in retreat at various places along the front line. It changed the war, because up until that point, it had been very stagnant. There had been a war of attrition. And the effect of that was that many Allied prisoners were captured. He said to me that he couldn't work out how it was that they suddenly got cut off. Um, and the way I would explain it is that the Germans somehow managed to come around the back of them and cut off his part of the trench. And uh, I always used to say to Grandad, well, you did the very sensible thing, Grandad, <laughs> of surrendering, you know, because people have these sort of um, Hollywood type views. Oh, you shouldn't surrender, you know. Well, you jolly well should surrender when you're in that type of situation. He reported to us that uh, he hadn't seen his brother Harry for a long time and presumed he was dead. And one day, uh, some of the, uh, his friends came running to him and said, there's Harry Marshall, there's a Harry Marshall in the camp. We think it's your brother. He's in the hospital. Um, and uh, Grandad uh, said, yes, it was him. The fact that the brothers were captured uh, in, in a, within a few days of each other is, 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 at this time of the war, it wouldn't have been that surprising, but it would be unusual that they met after they'd been captured because they were in different places on the front line um, and they must have been brought together um, for some purpose, for marshalling as groups of prisoners and the fact that they managed to see each other was relatively remarkable in the chaos of war. The families of the brothers were notified that there were a camp called Stendhal in Germany. 
In fact, it was very unlikely that they were there because it was a ghost camp. The Germans were expected to keep prisoners in conditions that were humane, look after them, feed them properly, although they could, under the provisions of the Hague Agreement, make them work if they were not an officer. So it appears that they were posted to this camp, but the reality at this time is that prisoners were used for work. And as a result, they were formed into what's called a commando. That's a different meaning to the word as we use it today. But a commando was a German work party. And they were sent then to work in the country, behind the lines, supervised always by German guards. But they would work, and work very hard sometimes. Grandad, I remember, he... You have to be very careful when you're dealing with my grandfather because he would be very quiet. He would be opening up about things that he wouldn't even tell his family. Um, and he would suddenly look, as it were, th through the fireplace, through the wall, into a different world. And you just had to sit there on the stool waiting um, and I think well, gradually he'll come back in a minute. And uh, he explained uh, that Harry died in his arms. And then he would just go quiet. Harry's death wasn't surprising in the sense that the conditions of prisoners towards the end of the First World War deteriorated, not necessarily because of German malice, although there were accusations of maltreatment, but mainly because of the lack of provisions behind the German lines to feed prisoners properly. And the other thing was disease. There were all types of fever that became very common. And of course, in the period that he died as well, you'd got the beginnings of Spanish flu. Um, and that, that accounted for a large number of deaths. So we don't know precisely the cause of Harry's death, but certainly from the reports, it was clear that his health had deteriorated, partly because he was having to work and he wasn't well. I cannot um, impress upon the, the listener, the reader, enough the sense of pride I feel that my family did this uh, on both sides, maternal and paternal. Um, and I'm only reflecting what I think every family will feel, but there is also a sense of hopelessness because you know that if it was left and this is a naive thing to say but if it was left to the ordinary man and woman in the street they would say come on let's sort this difference of opinion out we don't want to lose our families. And I'm talking now about, for example, the British and the Germans and the French. I have many friends in Germany and they all say the same. If only we could have got our point across, we don't want to fight a war because we know what it means. We are going to lose everything and lose everybody.